for a fertilizer to actually benefit your plants, it has to be present in the soil and the roots have to actually be able to absorb it. Most gardeners only focus on fertilizers, the NPK numbers, without thinking about nutrient availability and nutrient uptake. So today, I'm breaking it all down. We're gonna talk about how fertilizers work, how to read a fertilizer label, how to compare synthetic and organic options, and then I'm gonna use my real soil test to walk through a real example of how to choose the appropriate fertilizer for your garden. And if you want all of this information neatly organized in a way that you can refer back to it, download my free fertilizer reference guide in the link in the description box below. Let's get into it. Trying to choose a fertilizer can feel really overwhelming and it's easy to see why. When I go to the store and I look at the vegetable blends for fertilizer, I see an all-purpose vegetable blend that has NPK numbers of 444, for example. And then right next to it, I'll see a tomato and vegetable fertilizer that says 463. And then right next to that, I'll see a tomato, vegetable, and herb one that says 364. There doesn't seem to be a magic ratio. And to make it even more complicated, if your garden is like mine and has a whole lot of different crops all mixed together, like your onions and your tomatoes and your herbs and your squashes, it's not easy to understand which ratio you need. The truth is, most of us end up grabbing whatever fertilizer seems rational at the time. And although the numbers on the package are very important, they don't tell the whole story. But let's get started by talking about how to read a fertilizer label and then we'll start talking about how to choose which numbers you need. This box tells you the guaranteed analysis. It tells you the exact nutrients the manufacturer is legally guaranteeing. It will always show the percentage by weight of primary macronutrients, and those are your NPK numbers, nitrogen for leafy growth, phosphorus for roots and flowers, and potassium for stress resistance and fruit quality. And nitrogen is sometimes broken into WSN, water-soluble nitrogen, is much faster to release than water-insoluble nitrogen, WIN, which requires microbes to break it down first. The secondary macronutrients are only listed if they're guaranteed, and those include calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Then you have micronutrients, which are only listed if the company adds them. Those are iron, manganese, zinc, copper, boron, and molybdenum. If micronutrients aren't listed, it doesn't mean they aren't present. It just means the company cannot guarantee the amount. So now that we understand how to read a fertilizer label, let's talk about the difference between organic and synthetic fertilizers. I actually thought I had only been using organic fertilizers in my garden, and then I realized my favorite one, the Fox Farm Grow Big, is not organic. So there you have it. So organic fertilizers are generally in a more complex form. Take crab meal or neem seed meal, for example. They need microbes in the soil to break down those organic compounds, and then the nutrients turn into a plant available form. So because they're organic matter and they actually feed the microbes, in a sense, organic fertilizers feed your soil and then the plants. They're harder to overapply, and they're generally a slower release because of all that microbial interaction that's needed. Synthetic fertilizers, on the other hand, are already in a plant available form. That means when we use a synthetic fertilizer, we're feeding the plants directly and not feeding the microbes in the soil. Now it's not that they're really gonna do any harm to the microbes in your soil unless you overapply them, but just know that they're not necessarily helping the microbes in your soil. Synthetic fertilizers tend to be highly soluble. In general, they're faster to release, especially a liquid one. So a really common and successful fertilizer approach in a home garden could be using both organic fertilizers and synthetic fertilizers. Adding the organic fertilizers is gonna help you build the nutrient-dense soil in the long run, but in the short term, it really helps to have some fast results from synthetic fertilizers. Now let's talk about micronutrients. These are absolutely required for plant health, but in much smaller doses. Even though they're required in much smaller amounts than a macronutrient, they can have huge impacts on plant health. Micronutrients are essential for things like chlorophyll formation, enzyme activity, pollen formation, fruit quality, and overall stress resistance. And micronutrient deficiencies are very common in raised beds for a few reasons. 
First, the materials we typically fill our raised beds with are very low in micronutrients. So our compost, our bagged raised bed soils, our perlite, our cocoa coir, and peat moss, they're all very low in micronutrients. So our starting amount of micronutrients is very low. The second is what we just talked about on the fertilizer labels. Because companies can't guarantee the micronutrient amount, it's typically not even listed on organic fertilizer labels. So even though you may have a nice schedule with fertilizing, you might not be adding enough of your micronutrients like iron or boron. And the third reason that it's very common for raised beds to be deficient in micronutrients is because of all the watering and all the rain that may leach away those micronutrients. Before we get into looking at my soil test, let's talk about that one last thing I haven't talked about, which is how you get your plant roots to uptake those nutrients. Nutrient uptake depends primarily on three things. The first one, nutrients must be in a plant available form. So organic fertilizers need that microbial breakdown. Synthetic fertilizers are generally instantly available, but availability also depends on soil chemistry. So your pH matters, your mineral interactions matter, and your organic matter matters. Second, your plant roots must be healthy and able to reach those nutrients. So that means no compacted soil, no waterlogged soil, and no damaged roots to limit the uptake. And the third one is something that we don't hear too much about unless you dig down some rabbit holes on the internet like I did. The third one is you must have no nutrient antagonism. So what that means is that too much of one nutrient may block the uptake of another. Some examples are when you have too much calcium or too much magnesium, it can block the uptake of potassium, zinc, iron, and manganese. And if you have too much phosphorus in your soil, it can block the uptake of iron, zinc, manganese, and copper. And this is gonna lead us directly into my soil test results, which totally shocked me. So I ordered a soil test from Amazon called My Soil, and I did one for each of my long raised beds in my backyard. They both showed generally the same results, so I'm just gonna walk you through one. And it's really a lot of information, so it takes a minute to digest some of it. You can see right off the bat, I have really low nitrogen and really low potassium. I also have really high phosphorus and really high calcium and really high magnesium. And then the rest of my micronutrients are very, very low. But on the positive side, my pH is right in the normal range at 6.7. And the more I learned about these results, the more I realized that this is actually a very common result to have in a raised bed home garden. Over several seasons, I've been adding well-meaning amendments to my soil like compost, crab meal, neem seed meal, azomite, and oyster shell flour. Nearly all of these are rich in calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. There's a really good chance that the primary driver of the high phosphorus is the compost that I've been using. High amounts of compost, especially the compost I've been buying, which was bulk compost from a landscaping company, typically contains a high amount of composted manure, which generally is very high in phosphorus. I don't know about you, but when I look at compost bags, the vast majority of them don't have any NPK numbers. So this I think is part of the reason I got tripped up. Compost is a soil amendment, not a fertilizer. So the companies are not legally required to have a guaranteed analysis on the bag. So you could be adding nutrients to your soil without having any clue that you're adding too many nutrients. And so I was pretty blindsided by finding out that my compost is probably the main source of my high phosphorus. I emailed them and called them to try to get the analysis of their compost to confirm, but they haven't responded yet. So the compost I've been using for a couple years, combined with the fertilizers I've been using and the mineral amendments I've been using, have built up the phosphorus levels the calcium and the magnesium levels to really high levels that the plants can't even use. What's really interesting if you dive deeper into my results is that the low potassium combined with the low micronutrients and the combination of high phosphorus, calcium, and magnesium actually indicates a big red flag. This is blocked nutrient availability or nutrient antagonism. Remember what I said earlier about calcium and magnesium can block the uptake of potassium, zinc, iron, and manganese. 
and phosphorus blocks the uptake of iron, zinc, copper, and manganese. And what are the micronutrients that are low in my soil? Zinc, copper, iron, boron, and manganese. So my soil test is showing clear nutrient antagonism. So what am I supposed to do about this problem in my garden? I think this makes sense for what I've been seeing in my garden. My tomatoes are not really doing that well. In fact, the other morning I was sitting outside with my husband drinking some coffee and I was just Googling one symptom after another, trying to figure out what was going on in my tomato plants. And I think really the answer is probably a lot of different micronutrient deficiencies happening at the same time. So trying to figure out the right fertilizer for you is not gonna be a straightforward answer. It's going to require some searching around and figuring out which product is best for you. For me, I'm seeking a fertilizer that's nitrogen but does not have phosphorus or calcium or magnesium. To me, that's feather meal, although feather meal is slower to release in the soil. So for more immediate uptake, I'm gonna go with a liquid fish emulsion. It still has a small amount of phosphorus, but I don't think it's gonna be so much that it impacts anything. Now my potassium is also low, so I had to find a potassium source that doesn't add phosphorus or calcium or magnesium. So I'm gonna go with sulfate of potash, which adds potassium and sulfur to the garden. But what do I do about the micronutrients? It's gonna take some shopping around to figure out which product is right for your micronutrient deficiency. But the one product that I found that has all of the micronutrients that I need and nothing more was a product called BioAg TM7, which contains some organic matter called humic acid and plant available micronutrients. Without getting too sciencey, the humic acid attracts those micronutrients and then it migrates closer to plant roots. And the plant roots have a stronger have a stronger pull on those micronutrients and can pull it away from the humic acid. So the humic acid helps make them more plant available. Equally as important as adding nitrogen, potassium, and micronutrients to my soil is to stop adding phosphorus, calcium, and magnesium. So what I'm gonna do is stop using that compost I've been using for about two years. And in the meantime, when I'm adding organic matter, I need to be seeking some, some plant-based compost, like a leaf compost or some straw. I'll probably just use the straw that I already use as mulch and just let it decompose into the soil. And then I need to stop using crab meal, which is kind of sad because of my root knot nematode problem. <laughs> um, but crab meal adds so much calcium, I, I just can't add it back into the soil anymore. I'm gonna have to do a cover crop or um, a nematode control product like the Monterey nematode control instead. So those are the results and my plan for my garden, which tends to be a really common result, so it may actually help you directly. In the event it does not, I highly recommend that you go forward with doing a soil test just to get an idea of where your nutrients are in your soil. I really had no idea that the phosphorus was high in my soil. And the only way I found out was by doing that soil test. If you'd like to do the exact same soil test I did, I'll put a link in the description box to my Amazon storefront, and I'll have a collection of all the fertilizers I've mentioned, and micronutrient supplements, and the soil test itself. It was really easy to do. I gathered some samples out of the soil, I mixed them up, and then I took a small portion and put it into a container they provided, put it into a box they provided, and shipped it out. And I got my results in about eight days definitely do a soil test to find out what does your soil have too much and too little of. If this video helped you understand fertilizer in a whole new way like it did for me, be sure to get your free download at the link in the description box below. I hope you enjoyed this video guys. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button too to get more content from me.